We live in interesting times. Our country is changing. We are dealing with uh, issues that are new to us. We are a more complex country than we have ever been. We uh, uh, are finding new roles to play in the world. And the next decade or two is unlike anything that most of us will have ever experienced in the past. Um, we're going to be challenged as we promote democracy throughout the world. We're going to be challenged as we seek to invent new economies. Some jobs that we've had in our country will go away, as many already have. New technologies will require us to be smarter more flexible, more learned than uh, we have ever been before. And one of the big points I want to make this evening is that our conception of education needs to change. K-12, as you well know, is not enough. K through 16 frequently is not enough. And we're rapidly doing pre-K to 20 and longer. Why? Because it's the complexity of the world that we live in. The major issues that we face, in my opinion, have a portion of it that goes to what we do with young children. It's not that what we do with young children, if we just do that right, will solve all of our issues. But I can't really envision a systematic address of the major issues that we're facing without being very concerned with how we start children on that marvelous path uh, in, into uh, being productive citizens. If you're going to have a democracy, you have to have literate, smart people who can take the perspective of someone else, understand it, perhaps disagree with it, and resolve the differences in ways that are civil. We have a few facts that challenge us deeply now. There are admirals and generals going around the country making the point that our military now is rejecting about 75% of the people who show up to volunteer to join it. Why is that? It's because either the skills are not there, and remember that the military has a long history of being deeply involved in education. Think about what basic training is all about. Or people have already committed uh, crimes and have records that preclude them from national service. Um, I would think it's not overstating the case to say that what we do for children, their health and well-being, really forecasts what happens to whole communities, whole countries and cultures. And that's true at a variety of levels of analysis, economically, socially, ethically, aesthetically. The companies that exist in places like Silicon Valley or in the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina or in Seattle won't go to places where there is not a great educational system, where there is not an ethnically diverse group where there's not the cultural amenities that make life spicy and interesting and worth living. Blacksburg is a wonderful example. This is a wonderful place to live. It is not a 
typical uh, relatively small town because of Virginia Tech and the, the wonderful diversity that has been brought together here. But the kids who come to Virginia Tech to begin their careers have gone through almost countless encounters with other individuals, with ideas that have shaped them into being ready to be here and ready to be a player on the world scene. This slide is a, the result of decades of work by a dear colleague of mine, Dr. Peter Huttenlocker, who for the first time in human history mapped the synaptic connections in this wonderful two and a half to three pound organ that we carry around in this bony skull, well protected. And it begins to give us a, a sense of how complex early development is. These different colored lines represent different regions of the brain. So part of it's the visual cortex, part of it's the auditory cortex. And what you see along this line from conception out to about the middle of this graph is that there are enormous numbers of connections that are being made even in the first three years of life. As a matter of fact, just one number I want you to remember. 700 synaptic connections per second. Think about just multiplying that out second after second after second for a period of five years and imagine what that number looks like. The brain is where we put our culture, our language, our knowledge of science. It's where we put everything. And we know a great deal more than we knew 25 and certainly 50 years ago about what children need if they are to thrive. And by thriving, what I really mean is that children's basic needs are met almost all the time. Of course, none of us go through life without encountering lots of problems. But children who have their problems addressed as they are identified and who show some engagement and joy, you put all that together and you have a recipe for a child who is engaging the world and on the way to thriving. There are lots of ways to think about how you would arrange kind of the periodic table, if you, if you will, of essential uh, uh, elements. But one of the things my wife and I have done recently is to say there are at least four major classes of things that we need to look for and ensure in every place that a child spends time. In the home, in uh, early learning centers, child development centers, daycare centers, and so on. One is that there are health and safety practices that are ensuring the child's health and safety. That there are language and learning opportunities that allow the child to, to grow and mature. That there is a style of interaction with adults that is engaging and pleasant. And if the child is in an out of home care situation for part of the time each day, that there is really good strong communication between the teachers and the parents. And we've developed a checklist and for those of you who are interested we'd be happy to send you a copy via email so you can take a look at it and think about your own children, your grandchildren. Uh, 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 it's meant to be a very practical way to do uh, an assay of how children are being supported. One of the things that science does when we don't know how important something is, is that we do experiments. All of the drugs that you might take to help with a particular condition that you might have go through a set of trials that are very rigorous. Beginning uh, almost 50 years ago, a set of trials were begun to understand the importance for early childhood education and uh, 
over 40 years ago, my colleagues and I were very fortunate to be able to start one of those trials in uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. And we were just now in the midst of collecting data on children that we first saw when their mothers were pregnant with them who are now 40 years of age. And we have embedded in that um, series of trials, we've embedded experiments to allow us to try to understand which factors are important and how important they are. And so we wanted to begin by studying highly vulnerable children because if we could help them, all of society could benefit. But back 40 plus years ago, we didn't really know whether we could have a positive impact or not. That's why you do research. You do research because you don't know what the answer is. You think something might work. And so what we did was to begin a study that we called the Abecedarian study. I was a young assistant professor and I love big words. And Abecedarian means one who learns the fundamentals of something, such as one who learns the alphabet. You can refer to it as the ABC study if you'd like. Uh, but we really wanted to find out how important early education could be. And so in this study, we created two groups for treatment, and they were done by a lottery or by a random assignment process. But our control group was not a no-treated group, because we really wanted to ask about education. So we provided health care to both groups. We provided adequate nutrition to both groups. We provided family support services to both groups. And for one group, we created a child development center. Children were entered into it at six weeks of age. They attended it five days a week, 50 weeks a year, until they went to kindergarten. And in that, we created an individualized curriculum for each child, and we tried to provide the single best environment that we could conceive and, and enact. And that's part of what I want to talk with you about today. One of the things that we did was to measure the children's developmental progress at periodic intervals with people who had no connection with the program. We've published about 250 or so articles on this study. I'm only going to hit a couple of highlights uh, what the message I have is fairly simple, and this graph starts us off. For everything I'll talk about in the next 15 minutes, the red always refers to the group that got the educational treatment, and the yellow refers to the control condition. These are the scores of children on cognitive tests beginning at six months of age, going to uh, four years of age. And what you see is a representation of the percentage of children who maintain normal cognitive development. And for the children in the control condition, coming from undereducated and impoverished families, children who were perfectly healthy at birth, you see that over the course of the first four years of life, they go from being perfectly healthy and cognitively sophisticated to, to only a little under 50% of them retain that by the time they're four years of age. And the function of the early education was to prevent that decline from occurring. And virtually all the children in the treated group remained within normal limits. So we're talking about differences that are not just statistically significant, but we're talking about differences that are life-changing. If you don't do well in school, a couple of things can happen to you. One, you're asked to repeat a grade. You're usually very embarrassed by that. You hang your head. Uh, if you don't go down that route, you're likely to be placed in special education. 
This is 15 years after the program starts. This is the last year before kids can drop out of high school legally. And what you see is that by age 15, the likelihood of being retained in grade for these very high-risk children is cut by half. And the likelihood of going into special education is cut by 75%. As a result of early education preparing children to do what's going to be asked of them when they hit kindergarten. We also know that all the way through elementary school, junior high, and high school, that these differences in intelligence persist. Children who had the early childhood education do better in reading and math all the way out through uh, age 21. They're more likely to believe that their efforts are what account for their success. As a matter of fact, children are, who get a, a good early childhood education are more likely to stay in school, graduate from high school, go to college. They are four times more likely to complete a college degree. They're more likely as adults to be employed full-time, to earn more money, to be in more prestigious jobs, and less likely to get pregnant as a teen, to uh, smoke or use drugs, to feel mental depression. And in addition to those benefits to the individual children who participated, there was a benefit to their mothers in that the children who went to the Child Development Center had mothers who were more likely to go back to school complete high school, get some high school education, and by the time their children went to kindergarten, they were more likely to be employed, employed full-time, making more money, and in more prestigious occupations. So you see an intergenerational effect. Providing care for one also has benefits for uh, the adults. One of the things in science that we always are concerned about is whether the findings are replicable. And we have replicated this study 11 different times around the country. Um, we, we've had, uh, we've been fortunate, we've, we've had a lot of money to do this. Uh, money got, gotten through a competitive process, mainly through the National Institutes of Health, and Department of Education. And I wanna share with you um, just one finding that is so dramatic, by 18 months of age, kids who grew up in poor families already have risks that we can measure at the biological, cognitive, uh, and other levels. We created clones of the program we had in, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and we ran the same programs for the first three years of life with randomized uh, designs at uh, University of Arkansas, Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Harvard, uh, Miami, University of Pennsylvania, University of Texas, Washington, and Yale. And this little graph that you're seeing summarizes the results at age three for the children who were in the early education group versus the control group, and what you see is in eight of the eight sites, and overall, the differences favored the kids who uh, were in the early education group. This is a finding that was there at age three, it was actually there beginning at age two, but it was not there at age one. At age one, the groups were comparable. So, and in that study, we had a 1,000 uh, uh, participants. And we were able to look at a broader spectrum of families. And this is probably the single most important graph that I can show you this evening. It marks off the performance of the children at age three as a function of the social backgrounds and educational backgrounds of the parents. And in yellow, what you see is a line so that the, by age three, the kids who come from families with only some high school education 
are down with IQs about 85. And kids coming from college-educated families have IQs above 110. But what early education has done is to level the playing field. And it's leveled the playing field by having a disproportional positive influence on the kids who come from the most challenging families. It is closing the achievement gap before children even get to, to kindergarten. For the last 10 years, we've been working in Louisiana. And we've helped them. Louisiana is a poor state. It knows that its future lies in being able to educate its population better. We've helped them put in place a statewide program for four-year-olds modeled on certain parts of the Abbasidarian uh, experience. And we now have had 10 cohorts of kids go through that program. And we're following them longitudinally as they go into school. The first four cohorts all now are old enough to have taken the statewide tests at the end of third grade. And in Louisiana, they give tests that measure English language arts, math, science, and social studies. Again, the red bars represent the kids who got the program. The yellow bars represent children from the same backgrounds at the same schools who did not get the program. And what you see is a remarkably consistent pattern and these little lines here that you see, little white lines, that represents the statewide average of performance on these tests. The kids who came from very disadvantaged families actually, who got early childhood education, actually score above state average at, uh, at, at third grade. So the issue of can we make a difference, well, I think that question is pretty settled. We also see that uh, in Louisiana, we see a reduction in grade retention. We see a big reduction in special education placement over those first three years in school. And my good friend Jim Heckman, the year 2000 Nobel laureate in economics, drew this curve which uh, summarizes probably close to $100 billion worth of investments in the United States in various programs designed to improve the life circumstances of people who start life with a couple of strikes against them. We sometimes do job retraining. We sometimes do special education. This curve suggests that the single best investment we can make is in pre-K education. Uh, not only do these programs pay for themselves, but they return a rate of investment that Jim has calculated to average 10%. Any of you guys getting 10% on your money right now? No, most of us aren't even close. Uh, these programs pay for themselves before children are even out of uh, uh, grade school. They return investments as high as 10 to one. So why aren't we doing this? Here we are in Blacksburg and in Roanoke, in these beautiful valleys. We have wonderfully educated people, and we have about 20% of the people who are in real dire straits without the kinds of educations that the future is going to require, without the skills to participate in our democracy, without the skills to hold uh, uh, positions of real responsibility. Can't we do something? that will change lives, that will give people a better start. Many of you here are in various professions dealing with pre-K children. You are my heroes. You, you, you make things happen every day that change people's lives. But we must, I would argue, be more systematic about that. And whether you're a liberal, a middle-of-the-roader, or a staunch conservative. It comes out the same place. None of us gain if other people suffer and cost society resources and don't play their part. So 
You can be altruistic. You can be self-interested. You come out at the same place, I think. But the question that I leave you with is, what are some of the really practical things that could be done here in Blacksburg, in the New River Valley, beginning tomorrow, that would make a difference? That's the conversation I hope that we will have over the next 40 minutes. So I thank you very much for coming. I, I much appreciate your interest, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you, Craig, for helping us understand and share your sense of urgency about the crisis in early childhood education. We're looking forward to continuing to learn from you. Uh, my name is David Moore. I am the Regional Coordinator for Smart Beginnings, New River Valley, and I am on the research faculty at the Institute for Policy and Governance. Craig, we greatly appreciate your research, leadership, and your vision for early childhood education, and thank you again for being a Community Voices speaker. Yes, sir. I think I'm supposed to, to uh, I've advanced that one more. Yes, I forgot sir. to do it. There we go. There we go. Uh, your talk has helped uh, frame the next part of this evening's program, which is the interview and conversation with, with the audience. Uh, Christy Snyder, administrator of Rainbow Riders Child Care Center, uh, will engage you with some questions and help us look more closely at early childhood education. Christy. Good evening. My name is Christy Snyder, and tonight I'm going to be asking a couple of questions of Dr. Ramey to uh, find out a little bit more about his research and insights into the early childhood systems. And then we're going to be giving you an opportunity in the audience to also ask him some questions. So, Dr. Ramey, given all that we know about brain research and, and the research you've done, um, why, why haven't these changes been made already? Well, I think that there's a, a lag time uh, between discovery and implementation in almost every field. And I think that in human development, because all of us have been in families and we've seen people grow up, we uh, sometimes, I think, take for granted that things will turn out okay. But we know from epidemiology and from psychiatry and from medicine, that that's not always the case. And so I think that if we can take this really complex science that we now have and distill it down into the kind of insights that result in actions, the way we did with public health beginning 50, 60 years ago, that we will be able to make the kinds of strides that some other countries have made and that I think that we must make in this country. If we could start from scratch, scrap the systems that we have now, because there are some systematic problems in our current system, where would you start? Well, I think if one attempts to understand human development and to think of all of the institutions that that gets connected to, um, health care, education, economics, that we now know more than we have ever known in the history of man and womankind. But we haven't really invented the infrastructures to really get the information to the people who most need it. We've got to figure out how to say things in a different language. We need, we need media, we need businesses, we need people to understand that we're really all in this together. That in every community where there is poverty, where there is um, shame and disgrace, we all pay a price for that. We pay for it in crime, we pay for it in, in uh, inappropriate uh, health care, we pay for it in drug use. And so we are working to try to take what are sometimes these jaw-breaking big words and concepts and to 
make them into something that people can have everyday conversations about, but that are really about the insights that have come from um, decades of systematic science. Why does the early care and education system matter to local business? <laughs> what should they be doing to help? Um, if the people who operate early care and education um, venues didn't open tomorrow, Blacksburg would come to a halt. Um, uh, we have undergone such a, a dramatic demographic change in this uh, country, and I'm sure it's true in Blacksburg. You know, in 1950, only about one out of five married women with children worked outside the home. That is now the norm, not the exception. And as a matter of fact, right now, well over 50% of all of the women with children under the age of one are in the paid labor force. So we have built an economy that expects a broad participation from two working parents, or if it's a single parent, in our TANF reform, we've said, if you're gonna get the support, you either have to continue your education and or go into the paid labor force. So we've already crossed uh, a set of decision points, and I don't think that there's much likely that we're gonna go back. I mean, I don't know whether you some of you aren't even old enough to know what Ozzy and Harriet means, but most of us never thought that was a real family anyway, because the guy never went to work and the woman was always home. And, uh, so I don't think we're going to return to uh, a time that maybe never existed. Um, we need smart women in the paid labor force uh, we need them in a variety of, of areas from neurosurgery to, you know, to retail to anything, everything uh, along the way. Um, it's the right thing to do. It's the smart thing to do. But when we do that, we shouldn't be doing it by doing a poor turn for our children. That's not a good trade-off. So I think that we can do it better. I think we should do it better. I think the question is, how do we finance it? With all the implications in brain research, what, what would you tell to caregivers, those uh, people here tonight that are teachers, early childhood teachers, those people that are parents, those that may be grandparents who are caring for young children? What are some of the implications of this research and what should we know? Well, I think it's clear that people are important to children in direct proportion to the number of hours that they are responsible for the care of that child. And we have a fairly complex but somewhat patchwork quilt arrangement now. So we have, we have teachers, we have daycare providers, we have extended family, and I think it's very important that we try our best to get to the same page so we're sending consistent messages to young children that are healthful, growth enhancing, uh, and positive. And I think that's, that's an accomplishable um, uh, goal that's one of the reasons why my wife and I have created this four diamond model, if you will, to allow people to have conversations about what we think are some of the most important dimensions of life. If we don't agree, it's kind of hard for us to be giving the child consistent messages. So from an economic standpoint, why should we be investing in early childhood education? Well, if we think that democracy is worth having, if we think that personal security is worth having, 
if we think that our leadership role in the world is worth preserving, if we think that giving people hope for a brighter future is constructive, all of those things say to me that we better be paying very careful attention to our children. And they are going to be paying for our care. So it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship, you know. Uh, uh, I'm sure everyone here knows families that didn't do right by their children, and their children, when they grow up, don't necessarily do right by them. So it's, you know, we, we cast the bread upon the waters, and they tend to come back to us. And that's true for whole communities. I think it's true for whole countries. So um, that's not the most idealistic way to think about it, but I think that's a practical reality we have to acknowledge. But, and I, but I think that life is more pleasant and interesting when we are more civil with one another, when we are more growth encouraging and enhancing than uh, controlling. Uh, it's been interesting to me in the last few years to see that the military is finally really taking some interest in early childhood systems and early childhood programs. Can you talk a little bit about why they're beginning to uh, get more involved in the early childhood dilemma in this country? Well, we, we put on a conference in Washington um, not very long ago, uh, and we had the head of the early childhood program for the armed forces come make a presentation. Uh, the armed forces used to provide probably the, some of the worst child care. And then they realized that if you don't support the family, it means you're not supporting the soldier or the sailor or the, or the airman or airwoman or whatever, that there were so many problems that were bubbling over and affecting performance that they said, we need to address this issue. In a period of a little over a decade, they went from being near the bottom to being an exemplary child development program. They now run some of the best, most enlightened, smartest run programs anywhere that I've seen in the world. And again, you know, it was, you could, you could say that they did it for the children, you can say they did it for the soldier, you can say they did it for the family. They did it for all those reasons, and it worked. And so, Many people stay in the military longer because of that and other benefits. Um, and as you well know, we're moving into a phase in which we have multi-generational military families. That since we have a volunteer force now only, um, it is especially important that we have a military that fully understands democracy and fully supports that. I mean, I've worked in countries where um, things have changed dramatically and changed quickly. I, Venezuela comes to mind. Um, you know, when, when the military says, you know, well, you guys aren't doing it as well as you need to do, and so we're going to step in, or in Greece or other places. You know, our democracy is fragile. We've only been around for, you know, a couple hundred years. We need to strengthen it and encourage it at every turn, and, and the military is a great place to show that we, civilians, are ready to give back. And we give back in many ways, but providing high-quality care for military families is one of those ways. And now, thank you for all your insights. I'm going to invite the audience now to take a moment to think of some questions that you might have for Dr. Ramey. And if you are interested in asking a question, if you can raise your hand, um, we would like for your questions to be um, recorded on, the, on the, the film. So if you can please use the microphone. And I will turn it over to you. This is your community. 
Anyone raise your hand? Okay. And comments as well as questions. Yes. Um, okay, I have a question, um, and it's kind of big, just because when you were talking about women in the 50s and how we used to stay home all the time, or, you know, that's how we think it was, and now all women work, I mean, pretty much, unless you choose to stay at home. In this economy, most women have to work. We don't have a choice. Um, so what I'm kind of thinking is, is the government behind, you know, in so many countries in Europe, they've caught up and they're like, women are working, we're providing daycare and great daycare and they're paying childcare workers and giving them benefits. And here, it, it's kind of like this woman, a burden, a, a burden this woman has to bear working and having kids and doing it all and getting punished for it pretty much. And like, is this a, our government being just patriarchal and wanting women to stay at home? And is this our government trying to hang on to this traditional family that doesn't exist anymore? Um, is my we need more of you <laughs> in Congress and in the legislature. Um, I mean, this, it's being presented as a woman's issue, and it's really a family issue. It's really a society issue. I mean, many of you are steel magnolias, and uh, you know you can you can uh, you can juggle 14 things at one time and and still put together a gourmet dinner and all that. You know, there are just limits, though. I mean, you can't stretch yourself more and more and more. I mean, I had a. I had a, a call, which I will always remember. It was from a, a wonderful uh, 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 pediatric neurosurgeon, a woman. She called up and she said, Craig, I think I've been a pretty smart person all my life. I've, I've, I've worked real hard. I, I do some of the most complicated surgery. I'm about to have a baby, and I am scared out of my mind. I've never babysat for one night. I don't know anything about children. I am terrified. You know, uh, well, if if that's the case, you know, uh, there are a whole lot of us that ought to, ought to be 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 concerned. You know, uh, we need to see that we invited women into the labor force, and now we need them in the labor force. So the idea that we would not support families, uh, particularly when they're at the bottom of their income curve and just sort of starting off, or that we'd make you feel guilty for having to settle for poor care than you would like, strikes me as not very smart. Unfortunately, a lot of the people in the legislature look a lot like me. That's why I go around and talk to legislatures. You know, they're uh, older, they're white, they uh, are a little overweight, they, you know, uh, and they were reared entirely differently. But you talk to them about their daughters, and all of a sudden it's a different ball game. You know, there are daughters who are attorneys and accountants and, and running businesses, and they, they're looking at these women and saying, my goodness, you know, how is she managing all that? And so I think we need to be smarter in how we sell some of these programs. We can't have the life that we now enjoy without paying for it. And one of the ways to pay for it is not to pay women terribly to provide mediocre child care. I mean, that's a really not good public policy. Other than that, I have no, I, I have no strong opinions. <laughs> Back here. Hi, thanks for your talk. I enjoyed it a lot. Thank and you. I share your um, uh, grand view of nas you know, national security and national well-being and the importance of early childhood education. You know, in a lot of ways, I felt like I was in the choir that you were preaching to, but um, I had a baby in the fall and I'm acutely aware of this as a local problem um, and have really struggled with um, finding quality daycare for my son. And so 
I'm hoping and wondering if you have the ear of people who matter at Virginia Tech, um, because I've won I'm a professor of Virginia Tech, and I've wondered, and, and I agree it's a family issue, but I have also felt acutely that it's a issue for women, you know, as, as I am the primary caregiver so far and um, have a career and so on. And so I'm just wondering, you know, it's occurred to me a few times, how does tech expect to have women professors or productive and happy women employees? And so I'm just wondering if you have the ear of the people that matter at tech um, in the interests of women employees and in the interests of the community and so on and so forth. It's a pretty, pretty direct question. <laughs> I well, hope you I have, have good news. <laughs> I, I have the ear of a fair number of people. What's in question is whether I have any access to their wallets. Uh, uh, you know, tech can't be the place it wants to be. Um, uh, it's true for all universities. It's true for, for most businesses that are really complex. Um, Stanford. Stanford subsidizes housing for young professors. Otherwise, they couldn't get anybody to come. You, you can't afford to live uh, in Palo Alto. Uh, uh, we need to understand that child care and early childhood education, which I see as synonymous, no, no, no separation between those, that, that that's a benefit. It's a benefit that some people need, some people don't. So I'm very much in favor of doing some experiments with flexible benefits. I really don't think that we should be treating our society as if one size fits all. Some people will have children, other people won't. Um, but it strikes me as being extremely short-sighted that um, uh, we would ask you to pay for all of the costs of out-of-home care for your child. I mean, if we we used to do that in education. You know, we didn't, we didn't have publicly available high schools in most places until into the, the 30s. You had to pay to go to high school. And it dawned on some people who were very smart that this isn't a very good way to encourage our democracy or to develop our economic power. And so we spread the cost of, uh, high school and, and uh, what, what's become K-12 over a broader segment of the population because the entire population stands to benefit. That's also the great lesson that comes from public health. You know, treating communicable diseases helps not only the person who is treated, but it also helps all of us who don't get exposed to that. Well, and we spread those costs across the population. So I don't think that this represents some area that is so new and different that it requires us to, to invent entirely new strategies. I think it does require us to say we understand that the demographics of this country have changed, the employment patterns have changed, and we need to take that into account as we craft what we would like to call family-friendly um, um, policies. And the United States just isn't in the avant-garde in that. I mean, we're, we're, we're pretty reactionary. I mean, uh, and, and we're paying a price for it. It, it. If we just felt everything was okay, well, China is making very different policies and putting a huge amount into education, beginning even in very early education. Brazil is doing the same thing. You know, Western Europe has always done that. And you see a level of civility that's different from what we see in this country. Now, I'm not arguing we should be like them in all respects, but I am arguing that the quality of our life as a society, with its incarceration rates, with its drug use rates, with some of the really big negative things that we are confronting and paying for, 
aren't as prevalent in some other places. And maybe we ought to take a look at some of those strategies to see if they might not benefit us as well. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much for coming. Um, many of us in the room have been at this for a long time as well. And I was very interested in your data because you were working with our lower income population. And still to this day, many of those parents are not even thinking about a job from their depressed state, their low self-esteem state, possibly their drugged out state. And your data is really exciting. Well, thank you. How do we get that out to the public? Who's interested in your data? Secondly, where will the money come from? I've talked to politicians for years about our low income, early child care needs, and nobody cares. Um, can you give me hope there? Uh, we have one daycare in our community that is specifically targeted for our low income working families, but we're hurting for money. The federal money that was coming through the town is drying up. So I want to know where those of us who are committed, because I used to train PTA presidents. I said, we're not here for our kids. Your kids and mine are going to be OK. We're here for the kids of the parents who aren't as involved. So how can we who are committed, especially to our low income kids, so they won't end up in jail? Is it true that a child not reading at third grade level is part of the predicted prison, future prison population? Oh, I can write that equation even much earlier than that. Really? And, and I have. I can write that equation off birth certificates. Wow, OK. Well, my question is how, who that, in the That doesn't negate what you just said. What no, you just no. said is also true. Yeah. But as our prisons are becoming privatized. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. As my... our prisons are becoming privatized. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's but gonna anyway, solve... I'll stop. That's going to my... solve the problem. <laughs> yeah. My question is where can we go to find advocates and really become involved for our low income children for very early child development, childhood development? I think we go to the ballot box. <laughs> We're trying. We try. Uh, I mean, when we say we're in this together, when you don't want your 16-year-old who's just starting to drive, stopping at a 7-Eleven to get gas, and encountering somebody who uh, is um, hell-bent on um, doing the wrong thing, you can't move far enough away from it. You can't move into gated communities that so isolate you that you don't get affected. You know, you, I use Los Angeles as the example. You can't move far enough away. You know, you can drive 50 miles across the valley, but, but you're still going to face these, these issues on an everyday basis. So I think we have to tell people what we want not to ask them, would you please do us a favor? We are the ones who send the people to those state houses and to Congress. And I must say, I am quite surprised that there aren't more women saying, this isn't something we're asking you for. This is something we're telling you, you will either provide or you won't get reelected. You know? I mean, I reject the argument that we cannot afford it. How did I Mississippi it do it? Hand. How did Mississippi do it? How did they get their money for it? Louisiana? I mean, Louisiana, I'm yeah. sorry. Um, they started off using TANF dollars, uh, the temporary assistance to needy families, which allows you to, to invest in. Uh, and I worked with the superintendent, um, Cecil Picard, a brilliant guy. And um, he, um, he said, no, we want to measure this thing. And we want you to go talk to the legislature. We want you to talk to the Board of Education. Every year we've gone, we've shown them the data. They have shifted the funding to state dollars. And you probably couldn't rip that program out if you, you know, tried. I mean, there are people who look at these data and they say, 
it would it would be ridiculous. Bobby Jindal, governor, is a, a, a Republican governor. He has just said, and it's passed the legislature, all child care programs in Louisiana will now come under the Department of Education, and we will work to ensure that the quality in all these different funding streams is the same. So subsidized child care, as well as pre-K, as well as daycare will be asked to meet the same standards. I applaud him up and down you know, the, the aisles. I think, I think that's smart. It isn't necessarily that it's the Department of Education, but the places that have really done it well have said, we're going to make children a priority. In Georgia, they created a, uh, a, a cabinet level post for children. In, in uh, North Carolina, Jim Hunt did it somewhat differently. But the idea that we would have different standards depending on the funding stream, when we know that what children need to thrive is the same across social class differences and racial differences and so on, strikes me as, as being very backward. So it would take, it takes political courage for people to say, we're gonna hold our feet to the quality fire, but would it surprise anyone in here to, to, to learn that you pretty much get what you pay for? You know, what, what, what do we buy really, really cheaply that is really, really good and durable and works well reliably? Very young must go to daycare. Nope, and I I wouldn't make I wouldn't recommend that any of this be mandatory. You know you don't have to talk to upper middle class and upper class and rich parents and convince them about this. They they already know all this, and they are fighting and scratching. To, you know we, we moved here from Washington D.C. Washington D.C., New York, Chicago. Parents will walk over coals to get their children into adequate programs. And they'll pay a lot of money. What we're not getting is we're not getting the bang for the buck that we're putting into families that are on the lower half of the, of the income distribution. We're putting money into it, but we're not having them be of the quality that generates the kinds of returns that we were talking about a moment ago in those slides. That's where I think we're really being uh, short-sighted. If we're, if we're paying a good chunk and not getting the benefits, what's the point? We, we have a lot of work to be done, and, and those of you in the field know that we, uh, we're working hard. We there are a lot of initiatives that, that are trying to get started. Tonight in your programs, there's a small card. We hope that tonight you've been inspired. Uh, we appreciate you coming. We appreciate your questions. We hope that you've gained some insight and we'll take a minute to fill out the form in your card and leave it with us if you might be interested in getting involved in more ways in the work we're doing with Smart Beginnings. Craig, thank you so much. We appreciate thank it. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>